Thank you very much. I, it's an honor to be here. I uh, very much want to thank the conference organizers for uh, uh, making uh, everything so uh, straightforward, at least from the uh, perspective of a speaker. It's been very smooth. And I am going to try to keep my comments comparatively short. Uh, so that we'll have uh, plenty of time for discussion. So anyway. I, I do want to acknowledge that the title of my presentation is somewhat aspirational. Uh, so I have a subtitle, Why Does Economics Need Feminism? So in my, present, in my remarks today, I'm going to be speaking uh, both about gender equality and its importance, both conceptually in economics, but also in terms of how the field as a whole conducts itself. Uh, but I'll, I'll talk about the, the former first. So, so the first real, real question is, why gender equality? Uh, is this an economic issue? Uh, one might think from much of the training that goes on in economics uh, departments that it's really not part of economics. And indeed, when I began working on this topic, I uh, caused somewhat of an uproar in uh, the economics department at Rice University, uh, which hired me as their first woman in a tenure track position ever, and where I had the audacity to uh, have a baby um, early in my career, intentionally, although uh, my colleagues uh, were sufficiently concerned that this did not make me a model professor, that they had private conversations about whether, were I a real professional, I should have terminated my pregnancy simply because it was just not appropriate for an assistant professor to, um, uh, in their view, disrupt her career in such, such a way. Uh, so. Let's talk about gender equality uh, and, and its converse, gender inequality. It is fair to say that inequality of any sort violates basic principles of justice and impedes human flourishing. One can talk about you know, how, are we, how we're defining uh, inequality. Does it have to do with process, or does it have you know, how do choices fit in, and so forth. I did learn in some of my early explorations of uh, the labor economics literature, which I had not studied in graduate school, that um, much of labor economics concludes that women are in lower paying jobs in much of the world because they prefer them. I knew that something was wrong there, uh, but I, it wasn't ri really until I began speaking with people in other fields that I began to have some inklings as to where some of the sources of these conclusions came from. Amartya Sen, in 1990, provided evidence that at that moment in time, there were 100 million women who were missing, who would have been alive at that time if they had been given access to the same comparable life-saving resources, food, shelter, access to medical care, and so forth, as men. This study was replicated many times, and there were some differences in the number, but essentially the result was robust. This gender bias in mortality, however, is swamped by the pervasive unequal treatment of women across the life cycle. And you know, as one thinks about what economics is, ultimately economics is about human flourishing, and so it, it matters how we think about what people's lives are like. And so I'm just going to kind of run through some of the 
some of the ways in which the organization of economic life has been leading around the world to uh, differences in economic outcomes and for um, women compared with men. Childhood, some preference in birth. Uh, well, one of the reasons for that is that in much of the world, social insurance schemes are, are based on sons taking care of parents. You know, as I'll mention later, and uh, a lot of elder care around the world is also done by women. Uh, so it's not necessarily that it's the sons who are doing this work, it is typically their wives. Uh, so how can we, if, if we're thinking of a research agenda, you know, what sorts of cross-country studies can look at the economic regimes and how they interact with some preference, for example? Gender gaps in education, differential access to, to um, education, the availability of sanitation facilities, it's been highly documented that uh, girls in, in much of the world have less access to education. It's also true that in some parts of the world, uh, boys are becoming less well educated than girls. And there are many differences that are, uh, need to be, can only be understood through an intersectional lens, uh, also looking at race and ethnicity. And, it's important to remember that gender does not mean women, it means looking at uh, women uh, compared with men. Um, differential access to health care, again, that can be linked to some preference. Uh, the, uh, Amartya Sen has really noted that much of, you know, trying to understand why, why so many women have uh, had their lives cut short it can have to do with you know whether you know at the margin in one village compared with another, a child is brought to the doctor when sick, uh, or uh, how food is allocated within a family. Um, in uh, situations of famine, uh, uh, it has been documented in, in study after study that girls and women get less food. And uh, so this is, you know, contrary to notions of uh, e equality of sharing uh, the, that, you know, one might expect uh, with um, economic models that, um, you know, assume altruism within the family. I'm just going to try to keep track of the time. Um, early marriage and parenthood laws, social norms, uh, make a big difference with that. There are some parts of the U.S. where, with their parents' permission, girls can be married at extremely young ages, and this is not really well understood by many people. And how does that affect those girls' and women's future economic lives? Um, Sexual abuse and trafficking, uh, what, what sorts of employment opportunities can make uh, girls and women more vulnerable to being the targets of sexual abuse? So if we go to um, adulthood, and I'm going to go through some of these a little bit more quickly, um, we have a whole host of um, ranges of inequality. Paid work, well documented and understood. Unpaid work that has been less well uh, studied. Uh, uh, this is an area which I'll be talking more about. Uh, feminist economists have really pioneered research in this area. Um, high work intensity, which includes uh, how many hours a day uh, women are working, uh, again, compared with men, or uh, the complexity of jobs and, and so forth. You know, what is the role of patriarchal hierarchies and unequal social norms? Uh, how do these um, bring about barriers um, to um, the equal flourishing of women and men? Unequal access to health care, gender-based violence, 
And then finally, let's, you know, considering old age, what is the role of inheritance laws and norms, uh, which are not necessarily the same? Uh, who is controlling the land is not necessarily always linked to uh, who owns it. Um, income insecurity, child care, uh, work, re work requirements, all of these are issues that affect uh, the elderly um, in, you know, in varying degrees and you know, depending upon where they, where they live and the norms of those countries. And yet economists have been very slow to acknowledge gender as a fundamental component of economic inequality. Uh, you know, even very prominent economists uh, have long focused on certain aspects of inequality, for example, class, race and ethnicity, and so forth. But gender has been much slower to become targeted as, as an area that merits in-depth study and uh, policy uh, rethinking. And as a result, as, as I will be arguing, the economic theory is essentially less rigorous. Policies don't accomplish what one might hope them to accomplish, and, um, and so forth. I'll be speaking a little more about that. But when we think about why economics needs feminism, it's not just for the outcome of research, but it's also uh, for the field itself and how it treats its, its participants. Economics is an unwelcoming field for women. That has been you know, increasingly um, well documented. In the US, it's even worse for black and Latinx women. I'd like to just parallel the kind of forms of inequality uh, in the workplace more generally. Let's simply look at some of the barriers that uh, women in um, economics face in the life cycle of their careers. As students, securing job opportunities, writing research papers, gaining access to top publications, and earning proper credit for published work. In, in recent years, there's been a plethora of research looking at each of these uh, types of barriers that women face in economics and you, you know kind of trying to understand how these barriers come about what the consequences are they're both for individual careers and also for uh, for those who remain in economics and also taking into account the lost voices in thinking about kind of women economic students uh, Betsy Stevenson um, presented a paper looking at textbook representations of women. There have also been, prior to her, Susan Feiner looked um, several decades ago at the textbook representations of both women and um, African Americans in the US. And, um, but uh, in this most recent study by Betsy Stevenson, she showed that intro econ economics te textbooks refer to men four times as often as women. 90% of the economists cited are men. Women in textbook examples are, are not presented in the same professional, accomplished ways as men are, um, and so forth. All of these signal something to students. And again, uh, one can you know, question you know, what this might be or how this might be influencing the organization of, of economics. Um, Erin Hengel uh, presented a recent paper based on re her research on women's um, writing research papers um, in collaboration uh, with, um, with men um, or and, and found they're often given less credit in co-authored papers that the assumption is often that their, their contributions have been less uh, significant. Um, I actually had a interesting experience when I was actually being interviewed for uh, as, a, as a graduate student uh, at the university where I ultimately took a job um, uh, for a number of reasons uh, but this person told asked me uh, 
this was in the interview, and said, well, I noticed you've co-authored some papers. Are you able to write papers on your own? And I said, well, yes. If you look at my CV, you'll see there are some single-authored papers. And he said, well, our experience is that women have trouble writing papers on their own. And I then later learned that they had never had a woman at, in the department in a tenure-track position. So I don't know what he was referring to as their experience, but I, I think it had to do a lot with, with stereotyping. Um, uh, you know, and then the slide shows some of the other points. Women must be significantly clearer writers than men to have their work accepted. Uh, to major economics journals, will wait longer to have their work go through the publication process and so forth. So when as one is you know, evaluating women candidates you know, at, at various stages, you know, acknowledging these obstacles uh, within the profession uh, it matters. So it is not a surprise that uh, feminists uh, and have been you know, agitating about these inequities within the field. Uh, this really more recently uh, came to a head with uh, women in economics reporting. This is a New York Times um, article, uh, Rampant Sexual Assault and Bias. And the trigger for this was a, a study, uh, I'm sure many of you have heard of this, by a, a Berkeley undergraduate who uh, did a study of the Job Markets Rumors Forum. And uh, it led to quite an uproar. Uh, with the, within the ASSA and um, a survey that the ASSA recently conducted, uh, you know, surveying uh, uh, members of the association and found, um, you know, based on the survey results, if one believes them, uh, deep evidence of both gender and racial discrimination, with half of women reporting unfair treatment compared with 3% of men. 70% of the women respondents felt that their work was taken less seriously on account of their gender. And more troubling were the numbers who said they were stalked, groped, or assaulted. What are some of the consequences of these barriers to uh, women's, uh, women economists? Uh, only one in five tenure-track women economics professors, this is in the U.S., are women. Uh, gender progress has stalled. And perhaps more deeply is these are voices that are heard less clearly, if they are heard at all, uh, through attrition from the field. And uh, uh, the implications for economics uh, are that the knowledge is less accountable to broader populations, is less rigorous, theories are inadequately informed, and with the result of misguided policies. And I'll be talking a little bit about some of the insights that uh, support these conclusions. Um, here's a photo that one could uh, see. At, an, at an, almost any economics conference, you know, a group of white guys talking among themselves. And, and a real question is, you know, w having the conversations about economics taking place among these circles, really, does it matter? How, and, and if so, how does it matter? The, the ways in which it does matter have been uh, theorized uh, by such scholars as Donna Haraway, uh, or standpoint theorists, uh, uh, who have kind of made arguments about this uh, ways in which the knowledge can be influenced by uh, conversations, conversations um, among smaller, near, more narrow uh, demographic groups of scholars. Uh, they're are you know other um, scholars in social studies of science who have pointed to the importance of you know conversations in the hallways at conferences um, whose offices uh, people ha have situated near them and the ways in which the 
the, you know, the implications are that the ways in which the barriers to women being able to flourish in the economics discipline means that they are also more likely to be absent in these conversational circles like this, you know, or writ large in conferences, uh, in economics departments, and so forth. So a move towards a more ethical economics requires acknowledging the limitations of constructing economic knowledge with a very narrow community of knowledge producers and also recognizing that if we want to have economic theories or, or an economic practice and the resulting economic policies accountable to the economic lives of all people and not just to the predominant practitioners, we need to have more inclusive knowledge production. And that requires really thinking about what are the practices, whether it's how an organization con um, conducts itself or whether it's you know, how economics departments uh, conduct themselves in terms of deciding which fields are important and so forth. All of these lead to the ways in which a community of knowledge producers is producing knowledge. Uh, again, this is an area where uh, philosophers of science have written extensively. Uh, uh, one whom I very much admire is Helen Longino, uh, who has written books such as The Science of Social Knowledge, The Fate of Knowledge, which really look at the, the ways in which knowledge, that, how knowledge is produced is grounded in the lives of the practitioners of the field. So if we want to have more inclusive knowledge production, uh, ultimately it boils down to thinking about how to gain more diversity within the field and recognizing that that can lead to different priorities of study. What, one way to start thinking about some of the differences of this are you know, a standard economics department will decide you know, what are the key areas in, in the domain of economics that it thinks it needs to have represented within the department and which it imagines should be taught to its students. So some of the areas of specialization of people at this conference, um, methodology, um, some of you may be aware that there are some economics departments that have decided this is not important or worth representing on the faculty. Um, I'm sa sorry to say the Rice University where I uh, teach uh, is one such university that decided to eliminate uh, methodology, economic history, history of thought, um, and uh, as a result, they don't offer courses in the area, and so uh, someone who specializes in that area could not get a job. Uh, same, they don't teach um, gender and economics. Uh, so again, it would not be a department where someone doing work in, the, in this field would be able to um, uh, be employed. Um, again, when I switched my research from uh, studying the airline industry towards doing feminism. Uh, that did cause an uproar in the department because they had previously congratulated themselves on having found, found a woman who didn't do that gender stuff. Uh, needless to say, they were displeased with the change in my, in my research. Um, so one of the consequences of women taking this information from these research studies is the efforts to really disrupt the field and create change in practices. And uh, my aspirational title uh, is where I hope the field will be at, at one point. I can, can honestly say that it's not there now. Uh, although it's interesting to members of IAFI who, uh, or uh, which IAFI uh, was launched in 1992 and uh, and the journal two years later, 1994, we're now celebrating our 25th anniversary. Uh, 
feminist uh, economists have been talking about many areas that are finally bubbling to the top now. Uh, but uh, fortunately, we have many, several decades of research now to support uh, conclusions that have been uh, uh, brought forward uh, through many of these uh, topics. Um, uh, the field has now also been recognized by The Economist magazine as an um, area that deserves recognition as a, a specific branch of the field. And there are now economics departments that actually send out job notices that they're looking for a feminist economist. That you know, definitely was not happening uh, several decades ago. Well, um, I'd like to um, summarize some of the key feminist uh, economic insights. Again, this will be a comparatively brief summary. If, um, if we go back to the list of all the different areas of inequity across the life cycle, uh, you can imagine this, this list would be much longer mm -hmm. if I tried to answer all of them. But I'd like to just boil down to you know, a brief conceptual presentation some of the key points that uh, have, have not been as strongly emphasized in economic theory as it w was uh, constructed uh, during the course of the uh, 20th century and which uh, um, it is beginning to be um, moved, although at a somewhat glacial pace. So the first key <coughs> insight uh, really reaches to the micro foundations of economic theory, which um, much of which, which is built on the you know assumption that one can build models using autonomous agents. Uh, but essentially, the interconnection of human life that people are not autonomous agents, uh, at least they are not all of them autonomous agents, because um, there's such a thing as children. <laughs> and babies, and, and the taking care of them, and also taking care of the elderly and the disabled is valuable work. And that if we forget about it, then bad things happen. And we therefore need to have good ways of understanding and building economic models that incorporate the interconnectedness of human life. Uh, that taking care of people who are not able to take care of themselves is valuable work, whether it's paid or unpaid. And that the investments in children have e extraordinary future effects. Another key set of insights is that families don't all look alike, and that even the term family implies that all romantic or sexual relations take place in a uh, heterosexual context or in something where people have goodwill towards each other or and behave in a generous way that doesn't involve taking advantage of the greater power that one person in the relationship might have compared with another. So it's important to acknowledge and think about the implications for economic theory of single mother families, and of course also single father families, even though there are a lot fewer of them. Families with, where the partners are of the same sex and uh, very significantly relationships that involve uh, cohabitation or sex which are exploitative, where power dynamics are, play an extraordinary role in how the relationship plays out and is conducted and that the assumption that, that um, you know, much, in much bargaining theory on the family as it was initially developed, really sort of didn't acknowledge differential and bargaining power. 
that the if, even if we like to think about the ways in which people might cooperate in a family, we need to also acknowledge the ways in which the broader economic landscape influences how people interact, how this influences bargaining power and people's um, power within the family. Um, I could talk at great length about some of the economic research on, on these areas, but again, I want to keep my comments comparatively brief so, uh, so that we can have more time for discussion, but I'm you know, happy to talk more about you know, any of these topics. But I will say that uh, looking at uh, same-sex relationships has been a priority of feminist economics and uh, the different economic lives of families that are uh, uh, not heteronormative. Looking at gender-based violence, again, has been another uh, priority of feminist economics. Trying to understand intimate partner violence and how economic life uh, can lead in different parts of the world towards women being either more protected against vi violence or possibly put more at risk. Uh, and uh, there have, we have published cross-country studies looking at uh, you know, what is the role of a woman's income, whether it's higher or lower than her partner's, uh, what is the role of owning property, and um, how, how can this be protective or, or po potentially not protective, and what are the ways in which different legal structures interact with economic life. Uh, economic life extends beyond the market. Again, this isn't rocket science. It's something that economists have indeed acknowledged in this sort of lip service way for a very long time, but without really acknowledging how critically important it is that unpaid work is central to the economy. It's uh, that social values are not the same as market prices. And again, uh, this has been long acknowledged in uh, environmental economics, uh, but it, it's been a sl slower to, to take the field, um, you know, to, to be um, taken up in the field in um, uh, kind of labor economics, for example, or macroeconomics. Uh, you know, another area is, you know, the ways in which markets and home life are independent, and I'll, um, you know, be giving some examples of how this can influence um, how we should think about policies. Um, but of course, you can all imagine uh, the labor force participation, you know, or participation in the paid uh, labor force is going to be interdependent with, uh, with the ways in which gender norms play out in the home. And how do government policies influence those gender norms and what are the implications both for labor force participation and also as I'll be talking more about uh, for, um, for reproduction which feeds into uh, various aspects of economic life. Uh, how do economic policies influence the unpaid sector, another key area worthy of study. Again, I'll be you know, talking um, <coughs> more about that. Um, I've already spoken somewhat about exploitative relationships. Um, uh, but basically, the assumption of family altruism is contrary to all evidence. and you know, in a bold strokes way, it's convenient to assume that one doesn't have to go into these weeds, but the consequence has been that many very important economic uh, factors that influence human lives have been just essentially um, ignored. The, the key role of gendered social norms uh, 
and again, there are many scholars, uh, uh, feminist scholars, who have written extensively about this, but the, um, um, the influence of gendered social norms um, can, is played out on household gender roles, perceptions of what is valuable and what is a real contribution to the family. Um, there's a, there's been some research uh, conducted by Bina Agarwal on uh, some kind of trying to assess you know, what is valuable in economic work uh, in some of the communities that she's looked at. And the, um, if men were pr producing um, a crop or for cash, where they would bring cash into the home, that was seen in the, within the family as valuable, but uh, women collecting firewood to be um, um, used in cooking was work that was really, is perceived within the family as being less valuable. And so, you know, if the, the, these issues of uh, perceptions play into um, legal structures, um, in the U.S., um, some of the differences in legal structures really vary by state. The idea behind community property laws, uh, which many southern um, western states have, um, is, is the idea, you know, ultimately that when a, a family, that the fruits of, the, of income of a family are not owned by the person who had the paycheck, but rather our community property. And um, whereas in other uh, US states, the, the legal structure is set so that whoever gets the paycheck, that money is theirs, and, it, and the other uh, partner does not have any kind of ownership over that. But in, interestingly, um, no matter what the law is, if families don't practice it, it it can be irrelevant, and the, the differences between legal structures and social norms uh, has been um, heavily documented, both in inheritance um, laws and also, you know, in terms of how families operate. Interestingly, my uh, parents-in-law, um, sadly now deceased, um, lived in Texas, a U.S. state that has community property, and my father-in-law had an income and his wife was a homemaker, and he kept her on an allowance, um, even though legally the, f the entire family income was half hers, but because she was unaware of her legal rights or she didn't want to rock the boat and because of broader social norms, she um, essentially lacked power in that relationship in a way that you know one might not have anticipated through the um, kind of legal regime that was going on. And, you know, and nothing really bad happened as a result of that, but there are many cases where uh, uh, there, there were different consequences. But in her case, it actually did leave her to go out and ultimately get a second, to take a paid job after her kids were grown so that she could have spending money beyond what her husband gave her as an allowance. Uh, there are many, many stories of this sort. Um, so, um, what what are the implications for policy? Uh, one possible policy we can think about is let's take a situation of austerity, of an austerity campaign, and there's. Um, <coughs> a cutback in health care in a country, the provision of health care in order to um, have lower government spending. Well, if the, let's consider the effect on a family with a child with a chronic illness. If that child doesn't get the same level of preventative care and, has to, and is sick more often or has to go to the doctor more often, based on most gender norms, that child is more likely to be uh, taken care of by the mother who as a result may have to work 
in the paid labor market fewer hours um, or even quit her job altogether in order to take care of this child. So a consequence would be that a macro policy uh, that doesn't really anticipate the impact of the policy on the unpaid sector may have a feedback on the um, uh, labor force participation that it hasn't really anticipated. And so that's kind of one example of like what might happen if, um, if the unpaid, if the interactions between the unpaid and the paid sector aren't uh, taken into account. Many policies, in fact, reinforce rather than counter gender norms. Uh, there can be uh, gender bias in healthcare policies, uh, cuts in social services. There have been many studies looking at the changes in the welfare of, of women, for example, in Germany uh, before and after reunification and the changes in the regimes. Uh, uh, feminist uh, economists have been looking at China and how the you know entrance into the WTO has uh, and sort of some of the related policies have uh, caused you know differences in the economic well-being of women uh, relative to men um, through the kind of introduction of more um, male breadwinner bias policies. Um, so. Many of, these, many of these effects have just simply not been you know, understood or acknowledged, or perhaps there's sort of a lack, um, b based on the d differential aspects of economic power, kind of less, less interest in really trying to examine them. I'd like to talk about one, one example that has been uh, much in the news recently, which is uh, decreasing birth rates in many uh, developed economies. The decrease in birth rates, uh, perhaps one can see this not as su surprise, are more prevalent in countries mm -hmm. where uh, there are fewer, w where the cost of having children is more heavily borne by women. So lack of universal child care, lack of paid uh, family leave, uh, different treatment of uh, uh, women versus men in terms of the provisioning or the, the availability of family leave and so forth. All of these have, have led to decreases in birth rates in the places where these policies that are essentially more family friendly or which reduce the um, opportunity cost of having a child and so what has there been the response? I mean, so it's not a surprise countries like Finland or many Scandinavian and other Nordic countries that are, are very gender, generous and more gender equitable uh, have not experienced the same level of decrease in birth rates as, for example, Southern Europe or the United States. Um, and there's... Um, much concern over, well, what happens when birth rates decrease somewhat precipitously? Jobs go unfilled. One possible solution that, you know, sometimes um, is proposed or happens is to uh, permit more immigration. Uh, that's a hot-button topic uh, in much of the world and is, um, you know, leading to backlash. Uh, as well, very sadly, but it, it doesn't necessarily acknowledge the ways in which the policies are interacting with uh, the, de the decision simply to reproduce, which um, might be seen um, by you know, many economists as more sociological, but fundamentally has to do with um, um, you know, the, there are very important economic factors involved. Um, you know, other aspects of it are what are the career um, tournaments looking look like in different occupations? You know, does to, to what extent does the organization of work life also play a role? Um, but, you know, the consequence of generational imbalances, labor shortages, 
crises in the availability of care, these affect the lives of not just women. Uh, they affect everyone's lives and, uh, and are very clear economic issues that when brought, you know, brushed under the rug, lead to you know, extraordinary dislocations. Um, there are many other areas of examples of policies, and I'm just posting here some of the special issues that uh, feminist economics has published in the past 25 years, looking uh, closely at some you know, very specific topics. Um, uh, the, our very first one in honor of Margaret Reed. Uh, Margaret Reed uh, was an economist uh, who worked very closely on unpaid work, and her work was really just um, not adequately acknowledged, and in fact incorporated without acknowledgement uh, as well into, into some you know, later work by other scholars, uh, but uh, we wanted to begin uh, with recognizing her. Um, IAFI's uh, most recent conference looked at intersectional uh, feminism, which is very critically important as well. And I um, want to say that one thing that I'm proud of is that IAFI as an organization has focused not just on, on women as a kind of of unitary category, but really recognizing the differences among uh, women and also among men around the world, uh, and trying to you know think about how to be a more welcoming forum for including scholars uh, who were not part of the initial group who really launched the area of feminist economics. I spoke about this uh, yesterday to YSI, uh, but it's, you know, it's an area that uh, we have been very conscious of. Uh, anyway, so I you know, would be very happy to talk more about any of these specific areas, but I would like to um, uh, open us now to you know, really, again, moving to, towards just in summarizing you know, what would widening the economics lens mean? Um, essentially, you know, a, this aspirational goal is to bring more rigorous economic theory to the field, to provide better policies that uh, acknowledge all of these kind of unexamined factors to acknowledge that uh, we can only have gender justice if policies are more equitable and value the economic lives of all people, not just those of the predominant practitioners, uh, you know, with the ultimate aim of improving the well-being of all people. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to Yes. 
it's a it's an important area because uh, uh, one can. Uh, Amartya Sen. I first came across this in. Um, in the 80s, reading uh, a book by Sen, um, Values, Resources, and Human Development, in which uh, he pointed out that the edifice of economic theory really rests on being able to treat the family as a unit, um, but that it really was a kind of split personality of assuming that people are perfectly selfish in the marketplace, and then they go home mm -hmm. and the models assume that they're perfectly altruistic. And the reason the models require this is because if we're going to assume that prices reflect social, I mean, the um, values, then we want to be able to believe that the price that somebody pays for something reflects the wishes and needs of all people. But if someone is buying, um, cigarettes or alcohol when they have hungry kids at home, you know, are the, how are those kids' wishes and needs being taken into account? Uh, Sen has, um, you know, refers to quite a few studies um, in, in that book and in, in some of his later research. There have been subsequent work by um, feminist economists that have really shown that, you know, it matters physically matters in terms of how much children grow based on whether food aid is given to um, husbands compared with wives. In fact, uh, when food aid was being delivered to Haiti, uh, they quickly figured out the same thing, that they needed to give the food aid to the women in order to make sure that the kids got it. Uh, so I don't know if that answers your question, but you know, the you know, problem is that well, what to, to do about models that don't acknowledge this? I mean, ultimately, we have to think back on what is the purpose of a model. And uh, not all models can do all things. And if we acknowledge the limitations of a model, uh, perhaps we should also balance it out with some studies that look at what happens if you relax that assumption that you've made. And uh, you know, this is what you get if you um, make the assumption and then if you acknowledge that it's flawed, uh, let's look and see what happens, rather than just relegating that to a you know, kind of discussion at the end of the course. Thank you for the talk. This was really, really interesting. Um, and I'd love for you to say more about this. You mentioned at one point that autonomous agents has, has led us into some very dark places, and that seems Prima facie, very, very correct to me. Can you say more about how we would start to drop or modify our thinking so that this image of you know the atomistic individual making this transaction is balanced or, or refined so that it can deal with these really real relations we all have with each other that don't reflect the problem? Well, part of it has to do with doing research that isn't based on that assumption. So I, I'm not saying that every single model that is based on the atomistic individual needs to be dropped because you know, I believe in models and in simplifications and useful where they're useful, but one shouldn't assume that, be, you know, that policy based on a crucial assumption is going to always lead to the best policies. Um, so, so for example, looking at the unpaid sector and re having, including research on paid and unpaid sector interactions. Uh, in, ma in macroeconomics, there's a whole uh, group of people doing research in macroeconomics that tries to incorporate the, the impacts of uh, unpaid work uh, into, into the macroeconomy. It's not my personal area of expertise, but uh, th there is research there, and so providing a, a diversity of models and you know, looking at them and then looking at evidence in terms of you know, understanding what might be the consequences. So, so for example, um, but, but, well, let me just say that also looking at 
there are realms of economic life that reflect the relaxation of that assumption is really critical. Okay. So you, you argue that economics is a, a male-dominated discipline, and I was wondering whether the study of the economy in itself, regardless of being done by economists, or for example by philosophers, is uh, also to the same extent male-dominated. So, sure. what I was pointing at is the relationship between a kind of theoretical framework is dominant in economics, neoclassical economics, vis-a-vis -vis the study of the economy, regardless of the theoretical framework that you are using. So whether you see the same bias among economic sociologists, economic philosophers, economic anthropologists, or whether this is very much specific to economics. And even within economics, whether you see differences between heterodox economists and mainstream economists in terms of, of the, the pattern that you identify on, sure. on male domination. Because in your own autobiographical narrative, you seem to be doing a connection between how you study the economy and this gendered pattern. Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, well, just to you know, <clears throat> connect back to my own life, uh, I was uh, I became an economist because I was interested in environmental policy, <coughs> and uh, my first inklings that maybe this was not going to be the future direction of my work was really when I was a graduate student at Harvard, uh, one of uh, five women. Uh, admitted to uh, my, um, my, my class, I think there were 28 of us total, and really noticing uh, a number of different factors in terms of how I was treated and how professors were tre treating other students and, and so forth, including um, you know, one professor, um, this was some years ahead of me, but when asked by, you know, a colleagues about who his students were on the market, forgot about his women students, uh, and so forth. Or, you know, other scholars arguing that a marriage tax was a good thing because it discouraged married women from taking paid jobs when they, because they should be home with their kids, and so forth. So I began having some questions about the, the level of rigor that could lead to this type of analysis. Um, it, but it wasn't until I had a child of my own, uh, and you know, as I mentioned earlier on, that I began thinking that there was more important work to be done than what I was doing. I, it has been well documented in many different academic disciplines that the uh, gender composition of the field, and the more broadly, the um, you know, composition and other demographic aspects as well has a profound impact on the production of knowledge in those fields. So it's not something that is unique to economics. It's what, what is perhaps, um, you know, it's, it's perhaps that economics has been slower than the other social sciences to try to understand it, if that makes sense. scholars, as I mentioned, whom I really admire is Paul Longino, who has uh, written about what are the characteristics of <clears throat> groups of um, elite knowledge producers that 
lead to what she calls is more resilient knowledge. <clears throat> knowledge that is less sort of idiosyncratically based or situated in the lives of a narrow group of practitioners. And, and in referring to you know, the ideals, the traditional ideals of science, was that an idea that was held up to broad critical scrutiny from a variety of different dimensions uh, is one that would you know, is that one can have more confidence in. And when when a field is more narrowly constructing itself, uh, it's not really opening itself up to potentially transformative critique. And so your question is about how do how does one open up? And um, you know, and I do want to say that part of opening up means holding open the door to the possibility of ideas that one cannot even at that moment imagine because of who one is. So I know that myself, as a, um, a European descended woman uh, um, of a somewhat you know, higher, more privileged status, um, I would not have the same background to anticipate all of the feminist critiques that would emerge and that it would be wrong for IAFI and the journal Feminist Economics to essentially make the same mistakes that we were criticizing the economics profession for doing. Mm -hmm. So we have invested a lot of time and energy into thinking about how to make our conferences, you know, whom we publish in our journal, how can we in further enhance our own diversity? So one of the things that we have, uh, many of our members are, have been doing quite actively is thinking about um, forging connections with, in the US, with the National Economics Association of primarily black economists. Our board of directors uh, now contains um, scholars who are very differently constituated. And they're not all women. We have men on our board of directors. Uh, men are very active in the International Association for Feminist Economics. A minority, for sure, but made welcome. Uh, our, we have members of our board of directors from countries around the world, from Africa, uh, from you know different parts of Asia, South America. Uh, uh, we have um, long prided ourselves on wanting to include people uh, from different backgrounds, um, races, ethnicities, simply because of wanting to be listening and not just talking. And uh, so, um, the question of what does it mean to be welcoming and inclusive is, is a complicated one. Uh, one of the things that we have you know, thought about is well, what does it take for someone who is not present to feel welcomed in a field? And part of it has to do with you know, who, how is one speaking? So like um, the journal Feminist Economics, we um, have our policy on orienting articles to an international audience. Um, we've also been tracking you know, who is submitting to the journal and how can we do better in encouraging submissions from underrepresented constituencies. We have applied for and received grants to build the capacity to participate in um, our forum, uh, so you know, of scholars who are underrepresented, uh, we um, many, and I have to say that many European governments have been generous to IAPI and to the journal in our efforts to bring scholars uh, from um, parts of the world that you know have not been had not previously been coming to our conferences to. to um, to our conferences. So our you know, most recent conference, uh, it was not a kind of, kind of white, um, more elite crowd, but there were people you know, from you know, many different parts of the world, and um, you know, it's, it just led to a lot of different, um, a different ambiance for the conference. Um, sometimes, it, you know, it's a question of trying to find out you know, what one is doing that other, other groups might be, be doing 
you know, learning from groups that have been more successful in, um, in providing more diversity. So with feminist economics, one of the things that we spend money on is that when we get a paper submitted to us, a promising paper that we're going to reject because it's because the scholar has not had access to the level of uh, intellectual mentoring that someone who is going to be able to be a professional um, economist really needs. Uh, we don't just immediately reject the paper. We um, find an associate editor who is willing to work with the author and get reviewers to provide solid advice to the author even though the paper is going to be rejected, so that the journal provides more than just a, you know, a filter for what do we publish and what do we not publish, but rather also provides an educational experience to people who are submitting to the journal. The other thing that we have done is um, we have experimented with other ways of trying to enhance the diversity of whom we publish. We have um, sometimes paired an author uh, from the South or another underrepresented constituency with a more senior author so that they can, uh, through collaboration, participate in the creation of a paper that um, would be you know, up to our standards. Uh, we have also um, you know, in, you know, paid to bring them to conferences to you know, help find a mentor. All of these are, are activities that are expensive, both in terms of money and time. You know, and we um, have a little branch treadmill where we try to get funding to do this. And some years we're more successful than others. But you know, these are just sort of the tip of the iceberg of what needs to be done. But um, we're thinking, we've been trying to think about it. There are, um, there are uh, six more questions. Oh, okay. And ten minutes. I'll try to so give we'll shorter let's answers. Let's see how many of those questions we can cover. Good luck. Mm -hmm. So really quick, I was just hoping to like your question. As a, as a political actor within the field of economics. It's a what? Political actor within the field of economics. Uh -huh. Whether it makes any sense from your perspective, from your privileged perspective as editor of the journal and the funds in the field to think about generations within feminist feminists in economics. So the generations of C sweat, of the Marxist Leninist of the nineteen seventies, the people behind the journal, the new generation of your uh, well, that's a really good question. I mean, I'd like to think that um, many of the newer scholars are less traumatized than some of the older women scholars. Uh, but I think there are a lot of locational differences. Uh, feminism is been often said to be one of the few social movements where pe people become more radical as they get older. Uh, and uh, really it's the result of you know, going through the, the experiences that people imagine when they're young that they will not, never have. Um, I mean, it certainly happened to me. Um, I, um, I would say that there's so many locational differences to that, but we have very young members in IAPI and uh, on our board of directors and including on our journal editorial board. So uh, there definitely is kind of generational differences. I would say that uh, what the, the critical thing that happened with IAPI that was different from CSWEF was that we uh, decided that what we wanted to do was not just about promoting the careers of current women economists, that there was, it was about kind of the ideas that economists were coming up with uh, that would include both women and men economists, not just, not just women. Um, I, I was listening to the applications that you were, you were going through, and I was really impressed by all of them. Uh, all of them struck me as extraordinarily I, on the other hand, uh, I was struck, stunned actually, by the first question in your response to it. So I, I wonder if there's a risk of overstating the case. For example, the first question was about is there any 
mainstream economics, or maybe bad, but on economics as a household. I think you check Corey and all of those. Sort of oh, things. sure, yeah. No, I didn't so, mean to be saying otherwise. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, no, totally. Um, in fact, I would say that there's been a little minor industry of uh, feminist economists jumping on Gary Becker. In fact, we even once um, published a paper, I think it was called you know, by Francis Woolley, um, Getting the Better of Becker or something like that because he irked so many people. But even a lot of the game theoretic approach, it was more that much of this um, kind of modeling of the household just had this premise that, that when one wants to kind of go into that Pandora's box, you know, in economics of, you know, what is not in the public marketed domain, that the word household really is an adequate representation because it's not, because so much of what happens between um, people, not just women and men, but um, same-sex relationships, um, you know, kind of, relationships between adults and children, as we know, increasingly know, is you know, happening, happening a lot. Um, one could not use the word household really to describe these relationships. And they matter. That's, that's really more was my point. Not that this work was, yeah. I don't want to argue, I just I mean, does the economics of the household talk about sexual harassment in the workplace, yes, for example? Yes, and violence and violence. Well, so I think maybe it has to do with terminology because um, I think that the term household is, is a signifier, you know, in English to a family and there, and it's, um, the, the research um, <coughs> has, you know, whether you call it, you know, what you call it is sort of a different thing. Um, it's, it's not, you know, a, a, I would say that it is a feminist uh, transformation to be saying that power matters within the family, not just in the marketplace, not just among economic actors. Oh, one would hope it would be true in the sense that using empirical methods and looking at evidence will actually has the potential to uncover stuff that had been ignored when people just kind of uh, conducted theory that was less evidence-based. Um, but I, I think it also, we cannot get away from looking at who are the practitioners in terms of what questions are people deciding are important to study. <coughs> So it's, it's a, a good condition, but not sufficient. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I was wondering, you said you started saying that this was an aspirational talk. Uh, and I'm wondering whether you could be a little bit more concrete in terms of what the success criteria would be for you, those things that you were mentioning being realized, uh, in the sense of, uh, I, I don't know, if we're, of course, one of the ideas would be that uh, mainstream would recognize that this is important work, right? Um, but perhaps, I don't know if this is, uh, w w would say the, 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 that feminist economics as a journal wouldn't have to exist anymore, for instance, because it has been so embedded what you do there in the rest of economics that there wouldn't be any more need for a journal that is specific for feminist economics. Would you say that that would be, regardless of the fact that the journal would not sure. be needed anymore, would that be a success criteria for you? Uh, I, I would say that in general, yes, if that, were, if that actually were to come to pass. I mean, that was one of the debates that happened in early years about uh, women's studies in the academy. Um, 
subsequently, you know, sometimes called gender studies, uh, sexuality studies, feminist studies, or combinations of those words, the idea being, why should there be a separate group looking at this when it could be done within the main area? And I, I, I mean, it, I would say that right now, um, you know, trying to uncover what could be said that's not being said because of some uh, lack of inclusion in uh, the professional power structures that are deciding research priorities and teaching priorities. Uh, that th if this type of you know transformation occurs, it would be le less necessary. If we look at the humanities, for example, like English departments, you know there there may be a journal. Um, I'm not sure if there is one, but uh, you know connected to like feminist studies of um, English literature, for example. But it would really wouldn't be the place where people go for research on this topic because it's welcomed everywhere, and. Uh, so in economics, it would be really wonderful to see uh, feminist research occurring in more kind of locations than IAPI, uh, the journal Feminist Economics. And in fact, that is happening. There are many more journals now publishing feminist inquiry than you know, was the case 25 years ago when feminist economics was launched, and many more departments that give jobs, offer jobs to feminist scholars. So I would say that a Transformation is um, underway, but it it could be um, it's got it's got a ways to go. Uh, but you know, one the, the work of the ASSA uh, or the AEA, you know, more recently in you know launching the survey and in taking seriously the research uh, um, of you know, David Card's student um, and him even you know encouraging her to go on with this project. All of those are really hopeful signs. Yeah. Can you speak a little louder? Yeah. Did I try a little louder? No, 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 just the last sentence. Then. Okay, so also um, uh, publications uh, that uh, uh, deal with uh, topics related to economic methodology are often in journals that are not um, recognized or that do not meet the standards that are required for tenure. So in light of this tendency, I was wondering how, how do you see the future of the, of the field? And I see that as an editor of a journal, can somehow steer the direction of the discipline, but what would you recommend to younger scholars uh, to face somehow these uh, uh, resistances and the problems? Uh, You're talking about younger scholars in economic methodology? Yeah. Well, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, I think that organizing, you know, conferences like this, and uh, collectively thinking about mm -hmm. strategies is is critical. Um, I mean, I, I know that you know my own interest in, in economic methodology um, was sparked uh, through my experiences as a scholar talking to people, coming to conclusions. Um, you know, as a graduate student where I felt there was something going on that they didn't understand and that I realized I didn't understand either. Um, the kind of academic strategy you're, you're talking about, I, I think it's a hard nut to crack to really think about. I mean, I would... Um, so maybe more, more um, practical, how, how So, so I was in a privileged position because I knew that if I was fired 
my children wouldn't starve. You know, ironically, it was because I, um, my husband um, had a well-paying job, and I was able to take this risk. And as a result, that was one of the reasons I started the journal, was to try to make it safer for other scholars to do that. Um, but it's, it's another reason why in sort of strategizing with the journal, um, I did work hard to try to think about what did we need to do to try to gain more legitimacy than we might, you know, have, you know, kind of naturally. And, um, you know, it's, there's so many different things going on, it's hard to know which strategies were the most effective. And certainly, publishing in feminist economics has helped for tenure for some people at some institutions, but probably not at other institutions. And uh, so it's, it's complicated, but I guess in my own case, I, I decided to really devote my, the bulk of my career towards thinking about how to make the journal successful and, um, and to be a stronger institutional intervention than it otherwise would have been. But um, it, was, it was a risk that um, you know, I took and it you know, had, um, you know, it took time away from other projects that I might have been, spent my time doing. But ultimately I thought, why would I want to be writing articles that would go into a void where they would just get buried like all the multitudinous other articles that women have written you know, over the past century where they had this or that complaint about the field, but where it wasn't really possible for people to talk among themselves and move beyond critique. Um, so I really tried to think about how, you know, to, to really be honest with myself, to think about, you know, what things did I personally need to worry about? I didn't need to worry about losing my job um, or you know, getting the approval of my colleagues. Um, but I was very conscious of the fact that a lot of other people were not in, in such a position. And so um, you know, it influenced how I decided to spend my time. Um, but I, I can't necessarily recommend that as a strategy <laughs> for everyone. I mean, it's um, so I, you know, maybe when during the break we can talk more. But uh, there are no easy answers. Okay. Well, let us thank.